Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's really great to be able to connect with you all today. So uh, as was mentioned, I'm going to be talking about obtaining community consensus for meta research projects and explicitly how to do that with the Delphi method. Well, it's not advancing here. There we go. Uh, okay, so just to start off, uh, a couple of declarations. I don't think conflicts per se, but just to acknowledge that I'm a, a steering committee member of DORA and an ambassador for the Open Science Framework. Okay, so uh, I'm going to be talking about the Delphi method today, but I'm going to be doing so in context to a paper that uh, our team published in January, uh, a Community Consensus on Core Open Science Practices to Monitor in Biomedicine. So uh, just to start off, I wanted to give a bit of context to that project because I'm going to be using it to illustrate the Delphi method. So uh, for this project, we had a vision, and that was to create an automated institutional open science dashboard. So the idea here was that we would create a tool that institutions, specifically biomedical institutions, uh, would be able to use to run their research publication output through to find out information about how they're faring on open science practices. So for instance, you know, if they put their, their papers into our tool, they might find out, okay, you know, 70% are published open access. Um, maybe 50% have open data that correspond. This was our vision. And our idea was that uh, this tool would have sort of two purposes. The first was that it would be able to track compliance to mandates. So for instance, something like open access publishing, there are a lot of mandates for that in various jurisdictions. So our tool could actually help institutions see how they're doing on, on meeting that mandate. Uh, but it would also, the secondary function would be to uh, actually implement open science more effectively. So for instance, some practices, uh, most jurisdictions don't have mandates for. So for instance, something like creating a preprint, um, an institution could actually use our tool to see how they're doing with preprints and then come up with like educational interventions to implement and then monitor preprinting over time. So th this was sort of the vision that we had for our dashboard. But we had a little bit of concern in terms of how we would create this tool in that even in the sort of narrow communities that we were working in as a project team, uh, we felt that like the definition of what open science was and what therefore ought to be tracked in our dashboard uh, was quite variable. So even something like open access publishing, how you define open access publishing uh, was really critical. So for instance, in some jurisdictions, of course, immediate open access is the norm. We've got this sort of uh, plan S compliance that people are, are, are salient of. Whereas in other jurisdictions, uh, you know, including Canada, a 12 month embargo period is, is quite normal. So what we wanted to do is come up with a consensus around sort of what practices we should be recording in these dashboards and then how to actually compute them. With the idea being that these could also provide kind of like a core set of open science practices that as a community within and across institutions, we could track over time. And there's this expression if you know Field of Dreams, uh, if you build it, they will come. And it's the idea that if you produce a tool, people will come and use it. So, you know, you fill a need for the community. And when you, you, you do that, they will come and they will use your tool and that tool will be the solution. Uh, our experience and, and thoughts, and in fact, in the entire field of implementation science, suggests that that, that expression is not true. So uh, if you build it, oftentimes people do not come. Uh, so you can create all kinds of wonderful tools. But if you create things without consultation from the community, it often means those tools, perhaps unsurprisingly, don't actually fit the needs of the community or address the specific uh, community problem. So what was really inherent in our vision to create this dashboard was to take a community-centered approach. So we would start off with a Delphi to establish what should actually be reported in the dashboard as we started to develop it. So at the core of, of our sort of Delphi, our, our initial question is, you know, what actually is open science? Uh, and as a consequence of, of that definition, we could determine what we want to report in our dashboard. So, you know, there's a whole range of open science practices. It's, uh, open science is a, a transparency uh, uh, practice, but it's also sort of a um, field of thought or sort of a philosophy uh, around how to do science. So we wanted to know, okay, what is open science? And uh, based on that, these would be the practices that we would track in our dashboard. So as I mentioned, you know, open access, there's clear mandates for that. Seem like we should probably include that, but we needed input from the community on how to measure it. Uh, study registration, again, we've got mandates for trials, but not for other study designs. So is that something we should be tracking? Should we be tracking it only for trials or for other things as well? 
things like reporting guideline compliance, you know, uh, funders per se don't typically mandate these, but journals do. So, you know, is, is reporting compliance, is that open science? And then even sort of further and more broad practices community members were suggesting were things like equity measures and reporting on like whether biomedical research engaged patients. So this is like very broad sort of transparency best practice. And the question is, is that open science? It was for some people, but is it is it for our community as a whole? So we designed this research program. Uh, it has four steps, and I'm going to give you a sense of the, the broad program. And then today we're just going to specifically talk about the first step, which was establishing consensus uh, for what we ought to report in the dashboard via the Delphi. So that's step one. The second step is kind of where we are now. We're kind of between two and three is to actually create the open science dashboard. So the infrastructure and the interface through which this will be displayed. And then uh, the third phase is to take what we've created from the dashboard and obtain community consultation. So basically in step one, the community tells us, okay, we want A, B, and C. Step two, we go and build it. And then in step three, we regrettably come back to the community and we say, okay, you wanted A, B, and C. We've given you A, C, and D. And how does that fit your needs? Because there are some technical constraints in terms of what we could automate. Um, and based on their wishes and what was feasible, we'll uh, conduct some additional consultation. And then the final phase is the actual implementation of the dashboard within these pilot institution sites. And our hope is that by taking this sort of community approach, uh, you know, and, and starting with number one and, and moving uh, to number four uh, with the partners on side uh, contributing to our project, that that fourth phase of implementation is a little bit less burdensome uh, than if we hadn't have done this. Okay, so we're focusing on that first step, which is uh, the Delphi method to determine what actually goes into this dashboard. So in terms of what the Delphi method is, it's basically the goal of a Delphi is to structure communication within a diverse group to converge on a common opinion. And it's used when knowledge is uncertain or there's no previous agreement. And essentially you can think of it as a way of retaining reliable consensus from opinions of a group of experts through use of uh, iterative surveying that's interspersed with controlled feedback. So uh, basically it's bringing together experts through an iterative surveying process to agree on something, usually on a controversial topic. So I'm gonna break this down in terms of the methods uh, approaches in a minute. I wanted to just first mention a little bit about the history of the Delphi. So the Delphi was uh, invented actually by the Rand Corporation in the 50s. And the original goal was to forecast the impact of technology on warfare. So obviously we're, we've moved a, a long way in our research from this original goal and topic, um, but it's the same sort of concept. So a, at the time, theoretical models for forecasting the impact of technology on war were not being very effective. And the Rand found that when they were br uh, bringing people together, uh, to talk about this and get opinions, there was uh, over dominance in focus groups. So we've all been part of conferences or meetings or groups where, you know, there's the one or two people that are perhaps, you know, a little bit louder and dominate the conversation and much of the room sort of just sort of smiles and nods at what they're saying, even though they may not agree with what they're saying. So the idea here is that through use of a Delphi, you can actually uh, control the room, control communication in a structured way to ensure that you don't get this overdominance and that you do get input from every single person in a way that's more uh, equal. Uh, so the original Delphi, as was uh, invented by Rand, uh, usually had two or more rounds of iterative surveying. And back in the day, it was administered by like postal mail. And uh, the way the first round worked was there was just a, a, a round of sort of open-ended questions. So for instance, with our topic, you might say, okay, tell me about some practices you think are related to open science. And participants would do that. Then the project team would take those statements in uh, from the first round and uh, put them into questions that would then be rated in the second round. And the rounds would continue until an agreed stopping point. And yeah, within each round, participants rate the items and they also explain why they rate it in that way. So, you know, you might say, um, okay, the item is uh, open access publishing. I think this should be included in the open access, uh, open science dashboard because there are clear policy mandates for doing this. So that that's my rationale. The next round, people would see uh, the items again. They would see the different explanations as well as the mean scores on the scale. So you could see sort of uh, what you put, what others put on average, and then the feedback. And the idea is through iterative surveying, 
people change their opinions and, and, and move based on the discussion others provide. Nowadays, the modified Delphi, there, there's many different modifications of the Delphi, but typically there's two or more rounds. Most often it's administered by email. Uh, often the first round is statements already. So a project team typically um, comes up with the statements and participants have the option to rate them uh, immediately in the first round, but they're also given the opportunity to suggest new statements that were not there. Uh, the final round often involves an in-person component. So there's a discussion that takes place, but voting is maintained in an anonymous way. And then again, rounds continue until an agreed stopping point. In terms of when you use the Delphi method, it's typically used to set priorities um, on a controversial issue uh, to develop policies or guidelines. So in clinical uh, medicine, a lot of clinical practice guidelines are developed by a, a consensus through a Delphi, as well as to forecast into the future. So things that are sort of unpredictable and beyond the current data. I wanted to stress that, you know, th those are the times in which a Delphi is appropriate but that you should only use the Delphi when there's no better technique. So the Delphi actually, when we, we probably all seen this sort of hierarchy, um, it actually falls at the, the various, uh, the lowest levels, the weakest level of evidence. So you're bringing together experts and you're consolidating opinions. So if there's a way to get at your question through like an empirical study, then you should do that because it's, it's a better way to approach your research, a higher level of evidence. Uh, it's only when there's controversy, and you know, you're forecasting the future, you're coming up with sort of a consensus statement uh, that the Delphi would be appropriate. It's, it's, it's really uh, you know, not, not the best method if there's an alternative that's, that's more um, specific in, in terms of investigation that you can do empirically. The characteristics of a Delphi are that there's anonymous participation in the survey, iterative surveying. So it's quite different than like a cross-sectional survey where it's just a sort of one time finding out what people think. The idea is that over time through iterative surveying, you actually see a shifting of responses, which is sort of specific to the Delphi method. And this idea of controlled feedback. So this idea that people are providing rationale for the responses that others are then uh, provided with, and then they evaluate that and then they move forward. And you know that controlled feedback, again, like in point one is anonymous. So you don't know who's saying what, but you're presented with all the information on a sort of equal playing ground. Uh, in terms of sort of breaking down the Delphi uh, more specifically, so by now you know sort of the Delphi is a technique to reach consensus uh, on a controversial topic amongst a group of experts. You should only do it when there's uh, not a better empirical alternative, and that uh, some of the key facets are that it's anonymous, uh, that it uses iterative surveying, and includes uh, components of feedback. Uh, so now I'm going to walk you through sort of the practical uh, steps of actually conducting a Delphi. So the first step, you, we need to identify the problem that you want to actually address in your Delphi and determine that it can't be resolved in another way through a different type of study. Then you need to establish a panel of members, which are basically the participants that will take part in your iterative surveying. Then you actually administer, administer the surveys. And then you have a criteria for consensus at which you stop administering the surveys and you say, okay, this is what we've agreed to. So I'm gonna walk you through step-by-step step, um, what you need to consider at each of these phases of the implementing the methods. And then I'm gonna illustrate what we did in our open science dashboard project for each of these steps or our, our specific approach. So with identifying a problem, uh, I've done many Delphi's and most of the Delphi's that I do, I typically start with a systematic or a scoping review as the input to uh, the Delphi. So, you know, this is the current knowledge we have on a topic. And now we want to forecast from that forward or, you know, create a policy based on that. So you are using like high quality evidence or you can use high quality evidence as the impetus for, for feeding into a Delphi. Other options are group discussion among a uh, defined steering committee. Uh, or through focus groups, so open-ended discussion to, to try to get at, okay, what do we need here? What, what, what type of solution? Um, so so that, that's the first step. The second step is very challenging, and this is the, when you actually establish your panel membership. So uh, it's crucial for the Delphi uh, because these are the, the experts that are sort of going to take part and contribute uh, to your consensus. And when you're doing so, you want to consider your end goal and you want to consider the heterogeneity of the panelists. So you don't want to create a room full of people who all think the same thing. 
and you have like this, you know, very neat Delphi where all the opinions are the same, everything is in consensus. Uh, the whole point of the Delphi is to bring together people with dissenting views and put them through this controlled membership. So it's actually, it can be quite uh, an art, I guess, to recruit these people because sometimes these are people that don't really collaborate. They're not really people who see eye to eye on things and to get them all to do something together uh, requires a certain amount of buy-in. So um, it, it is something that is a lot of front end work and very critical. And part of the, the actual recruitment is considering how to define expertise. Very controversial, like what is an expert, right? Um, you know, do you have to have a PhD? Do you have to have published on a topic? Um, you know, do you have to be leading a group, an administrator? Um, I think what's important is that you define that as a steering committee uh, up front and that uh, you're really clear about your selection of panelists. I think that there, there's lots of room for bias in this process. So what you need to do is you need to be really transparent about your goal and your process so that people can at least see what you've done and appraise that. What often happens in Delphi's is there's just no information. We just say, you know, we had 30 people, they were our panelists and they participated and this is what we found. But we don't know where these people were recruited from, how they became involved in the study, you know, what considerations were, were put forward. Also in establishing uh, panel membership, uh, something very practical, you need to determine how many people you want as part of your panel of experts. Um, Generally, with administering things online, you're not particularly restricted. It takes a little bit more time to go through a large number of panelists' feedback between iterative rounds. But generally, this is, is something that uh, you, you can be quite flexible with. Um, when it comes to a modified Delphi, so often in the third or fourth round, the final round, uh, many people modify their Delphi so that it's not just all surveys, but that the last round, there's like an in-person meeting where there's discussion. And that's followed by this sort of um, anonymous voting again. And if you're going to do something like that, number of panelists may be dictated a little bit in terms of budget as well. Okay, so the third round is when you actually administer your Delphi survey. So you, you've, you know, you've identified your problem, you've got this people, the group of uh, experts together, and now you're ready to actually feel, uh, feel out what, what they think on, on the particular topic. So what you first need is a round one survey. And when you're developing your survey, I would suggest that if you're not an expert in survey design, that you consult one. So consult a methodologist who has experience with surveys. Very basic things like, you know, double-barreled uh, questions can can really mess up the, the flow of your Delphi. So for instance, if my, my survey says like, do you like uh, yellow and red? Uh, agree to disagree on a scale of one to nine. Well, what if I like yellow, but not red? Um, you know, how do I respond to that? Maybe in the middle of the scale. Uh, this happens a lot with survey questions and it, it, you know, it's hard to reach consensus on something that's uh, disambiguous like this. Um, okay, so uh, when administering the Delphi, uh, presuming you're doing it online, uh, I would suggest using a uh, survey tool. So uh, there are lots of survey tools out there. I prefer to use purpose-built surveys for Delphi's. There is a cost to these. There's a cost to most of these. I don't know any open source sort of quality tool. I'd, I'd love to hear of one if someone else does. Um, I use uh, Wellfi and most recently SurveyLed. And there are tools that basically help you administer your Delphi in a really efficient manner. So in round one, you know, people rank or rate a, a bunch of questions and they provide feedback. What these tools allow you to do is in round two, represent the questions and they'll automate sort of the mean response and they'll nicely consolidate all of the comments that people gave for their rationale for each item. If you were to do this with like say SurveyMonkey or Lime Survey or something like this, it would be highly uh, manually uh, intensive. Um, when you're doing your surveys, there's sort of these iterative rounds of analysis. So after round one, I have to analyze, I've created my means for each item and percentages, determine what my consensus is, uh, look at the controlled feedback. So see if people have suggested any new items for round two, um, provided any feedback or rationale, and then you have to represent this in, in a second round. So um, when you're thinking about administering a Delphi study, you need to think as a, a project manager would. So let's say you want to start a Delphi in September for your first round and you want to have your second round in December. That means you have to have recruited and had all your panelists complete your survey maybe by mid-October so that then you have a little bit of time to turn the survey around and have it prepared for round two for December. Um, this, this does take time, especially if it's the, the first time you're doing it. Uh, so just something to be aware of. And then finally, uh, you have your consensus criteria. So you've administered your survey, you've done a few rounds, 
And then there's some sort of stopping rule, which I'll talk about the one we decided on uh, in a minute, uh, where you basically you say, okay, our Delphi has now ended. We look at what's in consensus and what is not, and then we report that. And this, of course, is uh, you provide an analysis of the results. So the results are analyzed iteratively round after round, but of course there has to be some final round analyses. Okay, so what did we do? So uh, you know sort of the general methods approach uh, with our open science dashboard in terms of identifying a problem. Uh, contrary to most of the Delphi's that I've done, we actually did group discussion amongst the defined steering committee. So there was a group of interesting uh, institutions who had like leadership and administration that had been discussing having some way of tracking open science. So they've been discussing the problem of like new mandates and new mandates about various open science practices, but they have no idea how they're doing. They have no idea how their institutions like fare on these practices and, you know, how it's, they want to get a handle on it. So we had this sort of group discussion and the steering committee sort of determined that this dashboard would be really useful. And they thought of some potential things that would be helpful um, to go into that dashboard. So they came up with sort of uh, some, some ideas of what we ought to report. With that steering committee, we then established panel membership. Uh, so we wanted it actually fairly hom homogenous institutional vision. So we didn't want, um, you know, institutions that were like not interested in implementing open science. What we wanted is a group of early adopting institutions that were quite keen on open science. They could be from diverse settings and have sort of diverse resource constraints. That was of interest to us, but we didn't want people that were sort of opposed to open science. We wanted people who were already bought into the, the, the common theme of open science and that they were looking at ways to implement it. And we recruited uh, like across the globe. So it was an international study. And we had a predefined criteria for selection of panelists and their expertise. So we had different uh, sort of stakeholder groups within each of the institutions that we recruited that we wanted to take part. So for instance, we specified that we wanted people uh, like uh, in scholarly communications, we specified that we wanted people uh, who were researchers actually implementing uh, open science, uh, university administrators. So we had very key criteria and each institution was told like that we wanted uh, gender diversity and equity in, in recruitment as well. So these were things that they had to consider. We also, uh, for our online meeting, wanted to have a maximum of about 30 people. So what we did is we recruited as broad as we wanted uh, for the first two rounds. It was a three round modified Delphi. Um, but for the, the final round, we did a random selection of 30 panelists. In terms of administering the, the Delphi, we um, in, engaged a survey methodologist to actually check our survey to make sure there was none of these methodological issues in terms of um, how we were asking our questions, as well as um, that the survey itself was clear and concise. Uh, we used the SurveyLet tool and uh, we provided group mean individual score and feedback in rounds uh, two and then provided group mean in round three and allowed for discussion. So we had this sort of uh, in person, I say in person, but it's actually because of the pandemic, it was a virtual meeting uh, online, but normally with a traditional Delphi, there's no sort of connection between uh, the panelists at all. So we had an online meeting over two days actually, and this allowed for, for discussion and then anonymous voting just using Zoom polling software. And then our consensus criteria was 80% agreement on an item for inclusion or exclusion. Uh, and we define this as like responses being in the upper third or the lower third of a one to nine point scale. And uh, participants actually had the ability to add new items in between rounds. So, you know, in round one, they saw, let's say, 15 items to vote on, but then they suggested new ones. So they would say, OK, you're missing this item, which I think should be in your dashboard. And then we took that in round two and we said, OK, someone suggested this is missing. What do people think? So I want to just very quickly walk you through sort of how this looked practically to the panelists. So this is just an example. So uh, in, in round one, uh, participants might have seen something like this. So please indicate your response on the one to nine uh, point scale provided. Um, and what they saw is, you know, an item. So registering protocols for clinical trials and then a big description about what that was, including sometimes hyperlinks out. Uh, for examples to sort of illustrate more. So they were asked to rate whether this should be included in the dashboard and to provide any comments uh, uh, on their decision they'd like to share with other participants. So what they might have done, you know, maybe someone would write this nine. They think it's, ex uh, they strongly agree it should be in the dashboard. And they might have commented something like, with all the policy mandates, monitoring just makes sense. So that's great. Okay, so what would happen then? 
uh, is that after they rated all the items that we as a steering committee had put forward, there was a question that was like this. So are there any open science practices that you think are core to monitor that were not listed in the previous section? If so, please describe these here. So uh, here are some examples of comments taken from the dashboard. So uh, there's nothing in the survey that speaks to tracking DOIs for materials like reagents. Uh, what about including RRIDs as something in the dashboard? Another one, does it make sense to include something about gender of uh, the authors in relation to open science practices performed? You tend to get a range of responses, some relevant, some not relevant. So um, some items were just like people talking about like why open access is really important, even though we already had an item on open access. So what you need to do is go through and code your responses and thematically group. Sometimes themes reoccur and therefore you only need to add a new item, uh, like one single item for all of those comments. So uh, you do that uh, in between the rounds. And then in the next uh, session, uh, you have to actually do your analysis. So this is just for each round descriptive statistics. So count data, percentages, and means. So for the first example with registering protocol for clinical trials, this is the scale. So as I said, we define consensus as 80% in the top or bottom third of the scale. You can see that actually we already reached consensus in round one. So this was over 80%. This consensus was chosen based on a systematic review. Uh, it is arbitrary, but we, we chose it based on the fact that this is what it's typically done. So what you do once the first round's done is you remove items in consensus. So people are not gonna see this again. They've already agreed this needs to be monitored in the dashboard. You code the new items and then you add them for consideration in the next round, along with the items that didn't reach consensus. So round two could look something like this. So the following items did not reach consensus in round one. Please reread each item, including the comments provided in round one and the group mean, and indicate if you think the items should be included in the open science dashboard. In this case, we had people vote just include, exclude, discuss at the meeting, which was the third round, or they have no expertise. So that was something in the first round. People had said, you know, I didn't know what to say because I'm not actually an expert on this type of open science. So uh, here we, we give the example of, not trials because it reached uh, uh, consensus, but registering protocols for systematic reviews. And again, you see um, the description there. So people would rate that. Uh, but before they did, they would see the pri uh, previous comments from round one. So systematic reviews provide the highest level of the evidence of the topic uh, or the research topic and the corresponding registering of protocols shall facilitate the planning and related research studies, et cetera. So there's like a whole list of comments that they would read through. And they would see the mean was 7.1 on the scale of uh, one to nine. And then they'd be able to rate that themselves. So, you know, maybe they said uh, seven before, but now they think, okay, well, uh, you know, most people uh, thought the same as me, so I'm not going to change my idea. Or maybe they were lower or, or higher and they adjust based on the feedback and the mean. And then there's new things. So uh, you re recall the item uh, commenting about research resource identifiers we would have a section that's something like this in this round that says the following items were suggested by participants. Please indicate your response on the scale. And also, again, comments about whether this should be included. So uh, you, we do this iteratively over time until eventually, as you move through the rounds, you get something that looks like this. So here we have the open science practices, round one, two, and three. So we can see for the first one, which was the trials example, uh, it reached consensus right away in round uh, one. Um, when we look forward uh, to the item about systematic reviews, that was the uh, the second example I gave, um, you can see, you know, no consensus in round one, no consensus in round two, consensus in round three. So over time, we've moved from, you know, 73% in that to uh, top uh, third of the scale to 88.2% thinking it should be included. If you look here, uh, you can see uh, some items, you know, reach consensus in the second round. So we don't have any data in that third round column. And then others like the uh, RIDs uh, that were introduced, there's nothing in that first round because they were suggested in round one and they don't actually go on to reach consensus at all. Others, this item here, uh, these are just sort of examples, but you can see it's in round three, which means it was introduced in round two. Okay, so uh, hopefully you've seen uh, a little bit about sort of what Adelphi is and uh, the sort of core practices you follow. Just very briefly, some of the benefits uh, that I want to highlight of Adelphi are that there's this anonymity of voting and commenting, which does reduce some biases. Now you've got this iterative re refinement over time and this idea that it's an expert consensus and you can make a decision to decide, okay, 
based on the limited knowledge that we have, what do experts think in terms of how we should move forward on this topic? However, lots of criticisms of the Delphi as well. So there's actually no universally agreed upon approach to conducting a Delphi. The modified sort of three round uh, Delphi I described, I think is probably the most common, uh, but not necessarily like uniform for sure. Uh, there's this reliance on expert opinion. So we've seen from the hierarchy of evidence that that's like the lowest quality of evidence. Um, some consider a criticism the lack of discussion. Uh, by using a modified Delphi, you can get around that. So you do have the discussion, but you maintain the anonymity of voting. Uh, one thing that is, is really interesting is at the end, you don't always know why things were included or, or not. So people change their opinions, but we don't have actually like a clear record of like what shifted. Uh, their decision making. So, uh, you know, you have the result, but you don't necessarily clearly know the process. Uh, Delphi's are also really time consuming and require long term engagement of the participant panelists. And it can be costly to host an in person meeting to engage and have this uh, discussion element. The generalizability is also very low to other domains. So, for instance, like we've created an open science dashboard for biomedical institutions, probably not a useful dashboard for, say, uh, humanities scholars. Uh, I wanted to highlight some examples of other topics or other areas where I've uh, implemented Delphi. So uh, this is a paper that I've been talking about today. It was published in January of this year. Uh, we also have this piece in Nature, which was a consensus on what a predatory journal was. So we also use thirteen, uh, or sorry, three rounds uh, in in this context as well. Um, this was a different piece uh, around sort of training. So uh, was core competencies for scientific editors at biomedical journals. So, you know, biomedical journals often, uh, their editors are, are not trained formally in any way. They're actually just sort of scientists who become editors. So we were looking at what competencies they ought to have to develop the training program. And this is an ongoing project that I'm working on right now. And it's, uh, again, kind of like a predatory project um, where we are defining uh, a consensus de uh, definition for MSC cells. So the idea here is that we as a community agree on how these are defined. And then based on that, we would also create a clinical reporting guideline to increase transparency. So through these, just sort of my own research program, you can see the ability to apply the Delphi to a range of different settings and communities. And I think that there's probably many, many others, but uh, the Delphi is certainly uh, a common approach in meta research to agree on standards or practices or definitions to move forward. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. I think I've, I've saved hopefully some time for questions. Uh, just to acknowledge sort of the, the team of collaborators, uh, the various institutions in our fund are welcome. And I'm happy to take any questions or comments folks have at this point.